Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, have your way in this service. Amen. Open with me in your Bible, if you would, to the book of Romans chapter 10. Uh, again, hello to everybody that's visiting. If you are visiting, we welcome you to our Wednesday night live service. We also would love to meet you personally. Come on out to Burke's Elementary at 1030 on Sunday mornings, and I'd like to meet you at our Welcome Center. If you are faith family and you're online, please let us know that you're watching in the comments. Always enjoy after the message to be able to go through and look at who's commenting, uh, who's connected. I always don't, I, I don't know who's all online unless you let me know that you're watching. So thank you for those that do let me know that you're watching. So the title for this series, and, and, and there's just one more part before we take a break for our Christmas celebration. We've been talking on Wednesday nights about the gospel of blessing. This is number six. So if you've missed any of the first five, please go back. This has been an amazing series and I believe it'll totally bless your life. Last time we looked at believing the gospel and then the week prior to that or a couple weeks ago, we looked at hearing the the gospel. Tonight, we're going to finish the three parts of that. And the third part is obeying the gospel. So here, what the scripture says in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 16. It says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report. If you're watching right now, I really want to ask you the question, have you been obedient to the gospel? Because according to what Paul wrote in the book of Romans chapter 10, he points out that there were a group of people, children of God, and not all of them were obedient to the gospel. And I wonder how true that is for those that are in Christ today, particularly for those of you that are online. My question to you tonight is, have you obeyed the gospel? I've been particularly looking forward to this message for a number of weeks because I heard in my heart, as it pertains to you, as it pertains to those that I minister to on Sundays, on Wednesdays, you know, as the pastor of Faith Family Church, it was as if I heard the Spirit of God in my heart saying that not all of us that are a part of Faith Family have been obedient to the gospel. So I want to talk to you tonight about obeying the gospel, and I want you to consider whether you've been obedient to the gospel. And if you haven't, I want to entice you to be obedient to do what God says. Now, obviously, we would like to think, especially those of us that are online, that we have obeyed the gospel. But in order for us to accurately answer the question, we would first have to know what the gospel is before we could claim to be obedient to it. Over the past six or so messages in this particular series, and even even before that, we've been identifying what is the gospel. So we know that the word gospel is in the New Testament about 100 different times. So when you say, have you obeyed the gospel? You're like, okay, what gospel are you referring to? you would have to know what the definition is of the word gospel in order to even claim whether you've been obedient or disobedient. <coughs> Excuse me. We've studied it through the scripture. So when you see in Romans chapter 10, verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel. That English word gospel there comes from a Greek word in the original text, which simply means a good message. That is the gospel. 
So when Paul was writing here and he said they have not all obeyed the gospel, he, he's specifically referring to they've not all obeyed the good message. Well, what good, which, which good message? I preach probably three messages every week, seems like every week of my life. Sometimes I take a break. Well, obviously, you know, there's weeks out of the year where I don't preach and it should be, I shouldn't preach every week. But I have ministered probably thousands of messages in 25 years of preaching. So when you refer to a good message, well, I know sometimes you might say, well, that was a really good message. I guess the other ones weren't so good. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but when you refer to the gospel as being a good message or a good message, which good message are you referring to? Particularly, we know that when the, when the Bible talks about, uses the word gospel, it's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, in this series, We've been talking about the fact that Jesus came preaching the gospel. And particularly, like last time, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, in his lifetime, in three years of ministry, he preached from city to city, all the regions of Galilee and Judea. It's untold how many messages Jesus preached all of them would be considered a good message. All of them would be considered the gospel. So which of them are you referring to? That would be a significant question. What we've learned then is the essence of the gospel. In this series, we've learned if we could summarize the teachings of Jesus and boil it down to just a statement, to, to, to say of all of the various messages, the Sermon on the Mount, when he fed the multitudes and he preached from morning to evening and the disciples were like, let, let them go home because they haven't eaten. He preached all day. If we could summarize all the teachings and preachings of Jesus, what could we make that statement to be? We said it very clearly and that's what we're ministering about. The essence of the gospel is simply this. If you hear Jesus, if you believe what he teaches, and if you obey what he says, you will experience the blessing. If you hear, believe, and obey the gospel, you will experience the blessing. Now that's really important. That's really profound. That, that certainly helps us to know that when it says that he came preaching the gospel, it helps us to understand that he came preaching messages. And if people heard the message, believed the message, and did what the message instructed them to do, that in one way or another, they were going to be blessed. They were going to experience something good happen, happening to them. We know uh, the, what the word bless, what to bless means. It's to say something good, over someone or about someone uh, to enable them to succeed or to prosper. So we know the essence of the gospel. One of the things that I want to remind you of, especially if you've been with me over a period of time, is that in every message that you hear, even to this day, there is something in that message that God is trying to speak into your life, which is going to require you, number one, to hear it, number two, to believe it, and it's gonna be something in there that's gonna require action on your part. What I submit to you is that some of us have heard some things, but we haven't believed and acted on those things. So when we read Romans chapter 10, verse 16 tonight, I believe it's true for all of us in one way or another. We've heard the gospel. Some of us believed it when we heard it, but we haven't taken that last step to actually act on it. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. 
I'm fine. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, it says this, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to look at me for a moment. If you don't have your Bible out right now, because of technology, I'm not able to put the scripture on the screen you are really at a disadvantage. If I were to ask you to repeat what I just read, actually, without looking at it, I don't know if I could repeat what I just read and I just read it. What am I saying? It is so important for you to be engaged when you're listening to or receiving a message from God because it's so easy for us to be distracted. So I want you, I, I'm going to have to go through this scripture again, because this is one of the few passages of scripture in the New Testament that actually talk about us being obedient to the good things that God is speaking to us on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Listen to this. This is 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Let's talk about that for a moment. <coughs> Has anybody ever troubled you, caused you some difficulty? I'm thinking about a situation right now. As soon as I get back to uh, uh, Texas, you know, I'm going to have to deal with a vendor that's taking care of something in our personal life. And it's, you know, kind of troublesome. Well, I've got, I've got to go meet the, meet the person, look at what they've done and go over it. But one of the things that I and you can be rest assured of is that it is a righteous thing with God to repay people who trouble us with trouble. And I thank God for that. That way I don't have to trouble people who are troubling me. Amen. But let's keep going. Look at verse 7. He says, not only is it a righteous thing with God to trouble, to repay with tribulation those who trouble us, but he also gives us who are troubled rest when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his angels, with his mighty angels. So we know that soon and very soon Jesus is coming back to catch us away. Amen. And not only is God going to take care of people who are causing us trouble in life, but he's also going to give us rest. Amen. If we have been experiencing trouble. Now, verse six and seven only set us up to understand verse number eight. Verse number eight says this. When Jesus, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse eight, we've got to understand it because the spirit of God is saying that not all of us that are watching right now have been obedient to the good message that Jesus has preached. There are some of us that are online and watching. God has spoken to you about your marriage. He has spoken to you about your finances. He has spoken to you about your self-esteem. He has spoken to you about various relationships. And there are some things that he's talked to you about that you have not been obedient to. And what the Bible says is that when Jesus comes, he's going to deal with two groups. 
according to this verse. He's going to deal with those who do not know God. And he's going to deal, deal with those who heard the gospel, maybe even believed it to a point. But for one reason or another, they did not obey it. We talked about last week the four groups in, excuse me, in Mark chapter 4 and Luke chapter 8. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus said there was a group that, all, all, in all four groups, they all heard the word, which is the gospel. Immediately, to some of them, Satan took it away. They were distracted. They didn't realize what was happening. And immediately, even though God, was speaking to them, they lost, oh, thank you. They lost what he was saying. Just admit, just like that, they were distracted and they lost the good message that God was trying to pour into their life. The second group, when they heard the good message, you know, God started talking to them about their finances being turned around, about situations and circumstances, you know, come into a, a, a place where they want them to be. But then when, 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 when it didn't look like things were happening as fast as they wanted, they let go of that word. They were offended. You know, they stopped believing that it was God's will for them to walk in healing manifested. That third group, you remember them. That third group, they received the word of God and it began to grow but they let other things in that choked the word and it didn't come to fruition. The blessing, whoo, glory to God, never manifested in their life. I mean, they believed that someday they're going to get married. They believed that, that situations physically where health and healing was concerned was going to, but they, they, they let uh, cares of this world, uh, deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things, entering in to choke the word out and it never brought forth fruit. But then there was that fourth group, like you and me, on Wednesday Night Live, glory to God, heard the word, received it. Even when a tough time came, even when we were tempted to be drawn away by other things, we held on to that word the gospel, the good message that if we hear, believe, and obey, that we're going to experience something good is going to happen in our lives that it manifested in the blessing of the Lord. I'm getting so excited about this. I hope you all are enjoying this tonight. So now notice, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, the reason why we're in this verse is because God's going to deal with two groups. In the earth, people that don't know God through Jesus are going to be judged in the end. Our job as the church is to preach the gospel to all the world so that they can come to know God. Think about in your life, people who don't, you know, family members or friends, and they, they don't have a relationship with God. They're not sure whether God even exists. Or if they do believe that God exists, they don't know him. They don't have an intimate relationship with him. And so when Jesus returns, as it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 8, when he returns in a flaming fire, he's going to take vengeance on those who didn't know God. Why would God take vengeance on those who don't know him? Because the he, God, has given them every opportunity to know him. Even nature declares that there is a God in heaven. And they have ignored the splendor of God's creation in the earth. They refuse to know God. And God's going to deal with them. He's going to take vengeance on them. But this scripture also says there's a second group. Somebody say second group. There's a second group in the earth that God's going to deal with. 
in that group are those who know God, but didn't obey God. Woo! Oh, I'm in this room by myself, but I'm, I'm preaching good tonight. They know God, but when they heard him, they didn't believe him and an act on what they heard. And as a result, they're going to experience uh, what you could call essentially the vengeance of the Lord. So what I, what I want you to notice is Romans chapter 10 is very unique as well as 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 8. Romans 10, 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. So there are people that hear it, believe it, for whatever reason, they don't obey it. And we need to deal with this issue about obeying the good message when you hear it. Peradventure, you get up tomorrow and you happen to be online and let's say Pastor Michael Todd or Pastor Joel Osteen is preaching an amazing message, ministers to your heart. Listen, you know, if any preacher is preaching from the Bible, preaching the gospel truth, and God is speaking to you through that message, then, there's, then you need to be obedient to what God is saying. This is why James said that you be doers of the word and not just hearers only. It's so important to act on what you hear. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 has the word obey and the word gospel. Romans 10 and 16 has the word obeyed and the word gospel. Let's look at another. There's only about four or five. And I believe you'll enjoy this. It's so important. We're, and just so, if you just logged on, if you're trying to figure out what is Pastor Stan talking about, um, we're talking about, have we obeyed the God? Ha, have, you, have you done what God has instructed you to do? Uh, one thing I love about my dad, he's done this for many, many years. I've seen him do it when he's counseling or, you know, visiting with folks. Maybe somebody comes in from out of town. Maybe he's out of town visiting with someone. And I've listened to him carefully. He'll ask a person, what is God saying to you lately? Oftentimes, I mean, it's, I mean, it's happened so many times in my life. You know, I get kind of used to it. He'll, he'll ask us the question. So what's God been saying to you? Jesus said it like this. My sheep know my voice and a stranger's voice. They'll not follow. I believe God's been talking to all of his sheep in these last days. There are some people that haven't yet returned to fellowshipping in church. And it's been over a year and, a, and almost nine months. What has God been saying to you? And have you been obedient to what he's been instructing you? It's so important. Let's look at a third reference in scripture. Ooh, this is good. Turn, we, turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 17 and verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. All right, verse 17 says this. For the time has come, whoo, glory, for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 18. If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? There's an anointing on me right now for your benefit. This is so important for you to get, so important for us to understand. This scripture in Peter, 1 Peter chapter 
4, verse 17 and 18. This parallels what Paul was talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. In 2 Thessalonians, he's talking about people that don't know God and people that do know God but, don't, but aren't obeying God. Now in 2 Peter, we have another unique occurrence. This doesn't happen often where the word obey or one form of it or another and the word gospel appear. Only four, maybe five times in all of the New, New Testament. The word gospel, a hundred times in the New Testament. But when you look at the word obey or obedience and the word gospel only five times, there's something very significant here. <coughs> Excuse me. So 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, let's break this down. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Woo, man. Peter wrote this almost 2,000 years ago, right? And he was saying to the church, he's writing to the church all over, which includes us 2,000 years later. And he says, the time has come for judgment to begin, not in the world, but in the church. Uh, I just showed my brother, Pastor Carroll, he's up here in Detroit with me. You know, we'll be heading back tomorrow morning. But uh, while, he, while he was up preaching, I saw because uh, he, he did the word study for tonight at, to the Salvation Temple Church. On my phone, I got an alert that there were 40 earthquakes, I think today, in Oregon or in the Northwest United States. And they ranged from 3.8 to 5 point something. I don't know if there was any loss of life, but that's a lot of rumblings. And they were talking about experts who are saying why it's so active. I keep saying to us as a, as a faith family, we're living at the end of the world. I hope I don't come across as, as the guy in the movie that's, that appears to possibly be homeless on the streets of New York, holding up a sign or maybe draped with a sign, the end of the world is near. But in all honesty, the end of the world is near. Jesus is coming soon. And I would say sooner than you think. Some of you think towards retirement or, you know, what will your life be in 10 or 15 years or 20 years and your children going up for college? I don't know if we'll reach those days. I believe with all my heart, I don't know when. It could be 20, 30, 40 years. I don't know. But I believe in my lifetime, we're going to see Jesus come to this planet again. Now notice, with that in mind, what Peter is saying two days ago. Now we know a day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. In the New Testament, Old Testament refer to that. Peter wrote this two days ago if you go by that kind of math. So it's really not that much time that's passed even though it's 2,000 years. But 2,000 years ago, Peter said that the time has come for judgment. Somebody say judgment. I'm asking you to judge yourself tonight on the question, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you obeyed the good messages that God's been speaking into your life? We took Holy Communion on this past Sunday. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And that's proper. And it's so important for us because the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Now let, let, let's break that down because mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Grace is when you get something that you don't deserve. But judgment is when you get what you deserve. Woo, this is serious, folks. 
Because Peter says the time has come for those that are a part of God's family to get what they deserve or for judgment to occur. Now, with that in mind, listen carefully. What's the judgment? Did you do what God said for you to do? He talked to you about forgiving that person and letting that situation go. But you won't forgive. You still hold that against that person. And according to the scripture, that's not right. He's been talking to, talking to you about it at your church. You've listened, you visited, you watched, you heard it on the radio, on the Christian station. The commentator started talking about the story, but yet you heard God deal with your heart about tithing, giving offerings, whatever it is that, or about not doing something that you know you're not supposed to do. But it, it just keeps, you know, perpetually happening. Listen, there's going to come a time where judgment happens in the earth. But Peter said the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Now, I know that's a little bit heavy, so let's go a little bit further so you can see where, where we're going tonight. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Notice this. If it begins with us first, what will the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Um, now, obviously, people that hear about Jesus and don't accept it, don't believe it, don't act on it and give their life to the Lord, you know, He's essentially saying what, what Paul said in, in 2 Thessalonians. You know, those that know God and those that didn't obey him. Verse 18 says, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Let me give you one more uh, before I get ready to wrap up and close. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 12, in the... Uh, verse 13, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. In the New Living Translation, it says this. As a result of your ministry, they will give glory to God. For your generosity to them and to all believers will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. Here's the third reference one two three four this is the fourth reference in scripture where the word obedience is tied to the gospel let me read it out of the uh let's read it out of the new king james bible it says while through the proof of this ministry they glorify god for the obedience of your confession to the gospel of Christ and to your liberal sharing with them and all men. So this is another occurrence where it shows that we've got to be obedient. Somebody say obedient to the gospel. Let me give you the, let's see, one, two, three, four. Let me give you number five before we wrap this up. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over. Uh, of course, if you've been married for any amount of time and are a Christian, I'm sure you've come across 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 1. And essentially, it's talking about if your husband is not obeying the good message that Jesus preaches in one way or another, that you can actually win them over to being obedient to the message that Jesus preaches 
not by talking to them about it, but by simply living a lifestyle in front of your husband that can cause him to be won over to the obedience of the gospel. But here's the point. The word obedient and good news or gospel is in the same verse. I've showed you from the word of God tonight five different references of scripture that indicate that the gospel also needs to be obeyed. My question to you before I wrap this up is have you obeyed the gospel? According to the book of Romans, chapter 10 and verse 16, Paul said, but they have not all obeyed. As the pastor of faith family, one person who's in spiritual authority, ministering to hundreds of people, I sense in my heart, not all of us that are a part of the faith family, that are connected to one another in this life, not all of us have obeyed the gospel. And if you want to get to the place in your life where you're experiencing the manifestation of God's blessing on your life, it is going to absolutely require hearing the good message, believing the good message, and acting on the good message that Jesus preached. And when you hear, believe, and obey it, watch out because something good is going to happen to you. <coughs> Jesus uh, said in Luke chapter six, uh, we got this, we did a series called Jesus Strong right before um, the flood or something along that line years ago. And we use Luke chapter six, verse 42 through 46 or 48 as the uh, scripture for the entire series. If you'll recall, Luke 6, 42 says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I've said? That's a great question. And I want to ask you that question tonight. You're online, you're listening, you stay connected. You know, we're faith family, so your church has Wednesday night online service, so you're on. But let me ask you a question. Why do you call him Lord? I'm not, I'm not talking about your husband. I'm talk, not talking about your pastor. I'm talking about your Jesus. Why do you call him Lord, Lord, and you don't do what he tells you to do? In one place, Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, then keep my commandments. If my mom were here, I would mess with her because she was messing with me about obedience. And uh, that's a very interesting statement that Jesus made. He literally said, this is in the book of John, if you love me, he's talking to his disciples. I believe he's talking to you and I tonight. If you love me, then keep my commandments. He's not talking about the Ten Commandments, but obviously if you love him, you're not going to break any of the Ten Commandments. Specifically, there's one commandment that he gave us. John 13, 34, he said, uh, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He said, if you love me, then do what I've, I've instructed you to do. He said it for our benefit, whatever it is that he's instructed you to do. If God has spoken it to you, you know automatically you have the ability to do it. Well, I can't just seem to obey what God says. No, you've got the ability because it would be unrighteous for God to ask you to do something, instruct you to do something. I'll say it the strongest, command you to do something. It would be unrighteous if God commanded us to do something and we didn't have the capacity to get it done. 
who am I talking to tonight? So in Luke chapter 6, he says, Why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I've said? Then he went on to tell him a parable. He says, the guy that hears what I say and doesn't do them, let me tell you who's he like. He's like the guy wanted to build a house. But rather than do it the right way, the way that the Lord said, he built his house without a foundation. He didn't dig deep. He just built it on the sand. But then weather happened. The rain came, the wind blew, the stream arose and beat vehemently upon the house and it fell and great was its ruin. <clears throat> Can I talk to you? Um, when a couple comes together to get married, they're essentially looking at building a life together. They don't want to build their own life independent and just have good friendships and love people. But what marriage is, is when two people say, instead of us doing life separately, building our own lives, let's, you and me, let's build this together. When divorce happens, it's a great ruin. What I see in Luke chapter 6 is a person, is a married couple who hears Jesus instruct them on how to communicate to their spouse, how to love their spouse, how to relate to their spouse, how to live as a married unit, function as one. But if you don't do what the Lord instructs you to do, when things in this life come along to pressurize that marriage situation, if you don't build it on what God says, it's going to fall apart and great will be the ruin of that house. My challenge to you is to obey the gospel, not just the generic gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but obey every good message that you hear to the best of your ability. One thing I love about church is every week God speaks to me. At least that should be your attitude as a Christian, the reason why you should go to church every single week and as often as your church has church is because every time your church has church throughout the week, God is speaking to you. You don't have to focus on trying to obey in its entirety everything written in the Word of God every single week. Obviously, you should obey everything written in the Word of God every single week. But the beauty of church is on Sunday, God's going to give you something to focus on. I'm not saying don't focus on all of the things he said, but he's going to give you what to focus on for this week. Glory to God. That's so vital. And I challenge you that when you hear a word, believe that word and find a way to act on it. And you'll go from glory to glory and from faith to faith. I close with Luke chapter 6. The last part of that story, Jesus said unto them, But the one that hears my sayings and does them. Somebody say, that's me. Oh yeah, that's me. I'm the one that hears what Jesus says. I believe it when I hear it. <laughs> and then I find a way to act on it. The one that hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you who he's like. This is that married couple 
that they dig deep, they take time, marriages work, they learn how to understand Babel, they learn the tools of communication, they take time to become students of the word, and they lay a foundation to build on. And now, because they built it the way that they were supposed to, when life situations come, when the enemy comes to pressurize them, and that stream beats vehemently upon them, when they have symptoms of sickness and disease show up, when a financial uh, obstacle arises, excuse me, anytime anything comes against them, because they didn't just hear it, but they have also believed and acted on it, when the winds blow and the storm arises, it can't shake it. Why? Because they built it on the rock of the gospel, the word of God. Woo, man, I done preached myself happy tonight. So uh, five times in the scriptures, the word obedience and gospel are tied together. Uh, this com concludes hearing, believing, and obeying the gospel. Next week, all I want to do is tie it into, <coughs> excuse me, I want to tie it into the gospel of blessing. We're going to close it out next week, so I hope you have time to join me. Be believing with me for revelation to flow as we finish out this series in Jesus' name. Per adventure, you're watching and Maybe God began to speak to you. Maybe there's some areas of disobedience in your life. Maybe you're not born again. We know that judgment is beginning in the house of God. But where are those that don't know God? I, I, I challenge you, if you don't know God or if you've not been living for God the way that you should, give your life to him tonight and I believe things will begin to turn around in every area. Pray this out loud. Mean it from your heart. God will save you right where you are. Say, God in heaven, thank you for this word tonight. I do believe that Jesus Christ, that he is the son of God, that he died for me, bearing my sins for me. They put him in a grave, but I believe he's alive. Come into my heart. Save me from my sins. Lord, I repent for all my sins. And I accept your offer of forgiveness. Therefore, Father, I believe I'm saved. I believe I'm born again. I receive the forgiveness of sins today in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. We also pray that you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit Get into a good word church like Faith Family. Hey, since you gave, it a lot, gave your life to the Lord here, this is a great place to start. And we'll see your life bloom and produce fruit in many, many ways. All right, Faith Family, we did it again. Had another amazing Wednesday night service. Um, we'll be headed back to Detroit in the morning. We'll look to see you on Sunday morning. God bless you guys. Thank you for all of you that made comments online. I'm going to go check those out, uh, but we'll see you in the morning on Sunday.